Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining uh, the fifth part of the GoEquipped uh, webinar series. Our speaker today is Dr. Jan Follert, uh, who received his degree from West Carl University and also worked at Imperial College London. And uh, Jan is a clinical and preclinical statistician, meta researcher, and biometrician working in uh, research on chronic pain and placebo. And uh, as we all know, has a special interest in uh, research quality and has been instrumental uh, in the um, equipped collaboration and work package free, if I remember correctly. And um, so he's interested really in standards for a better uh, experimental uh, and research and study design. And he's going to tell us about the uh, equipped framework today. So, Jan, floor yeah, is thanks. yours. Thanks. thanks for the introduction and thanks everyone for being here. Um, it's going to be my pleasure to um, talk about the equipped framework today. Um, just check everything working. Um, you should see my slides by now. You should see them full screen and they should move. Mm -hmm. OK, great. Um, so um, the Equip framework is uh, was my um, main task for the years uh, 2017 to 2021. Uh, it was a big project um, and, and part of the overall equipped um, that you may or may not have um, seen other presentations of. Just to set the scene, although I'm aware that I'm probably preaching a bit to the choir here, you all know that you'll know why we why we do this kind of work the typical scenario um, especially in, in neuroscience but in all kinds of biomedical research really um, is um, there there are exciting findings um, that are published in in um, what we might call Amani journals like uh, the, the big journals uh, there's a lot of media coverage over it uh, excitement in the field um, and um, we get we get really into it and there's lots of money pouring down to it. Um, there's a whole work stream going down that route. Um, labs all across the world uh, start um, developing into that direction. Um, and um, we find more and more data on it um, and everyone works on it. And while we do all this, we start to realize that maybe um, we can't really uh, sustain those exciting initial findings. Um, and um, that means that this process that usually takes maybe around a decade or so um, from this from this initial excitement um, over the, the many millions um, that are put into those research streams until we end up uh, with really coming down to the point that we feel like, well, maybe this is not sustainable and we can't really um, keep keep going to this direction um, is, a, is a very costly process, both in time and in energy and in money. Um, and as something that we see as, as hindering to the progress of um, science. Well, and why is that? Example from neuroscience, um, Alzheimer's in this case, um, there's many reasons. Um, there's disease heterogeneity um, that uh, we particularly in neuroscience have a lot to do with, but obviously also if you go to fields like cancer, in my field, pain research, there's something we really have a lot to do with. Um, a lot of things that we see clinically as one thing might not be one thing. Diagnosis and treatment timing might be really important and can be difficult uh, to, to point out, especially in uh, what we call soft outcomes like Alzheimer's or pain, something where we often don't really know the onset. Uh, it's um, We, we, we um, only work on it at a certain point when it has clinically manifested. Um, so even if we knew the perfect timing, we wouldn't know when that timing begins in specific patients. These are problems um, that we face. Um, but then, um, and, and there are ways to, to address them and there are people addressing them, but that's not really what we're gonna talk about here. But the last two um, of these things um, I do wanna talk about, that's generalizability and translatability of animal models and particularly robustness and reliability of preclinical data, um, because um, two of the things that we have to also think about is um, are the 
um, extrapolations we make from animal data, are they valid? Are the ways we translate something from animal data to human data, um, are they appropriate? Um, but also to begin with, is the animal data or the preclinical data we create, um, is it robust, is it reliable? Are the findings we have and present as definitive, really as definitive as we think they are? And there are several um, reasons for the low robustness uh, that exist in, in large parts of animal work. Um, low reproducity is an inherent feature of science, um, especially uh, when highly unexpected findings are made. Um, and that is a bit going against the grain of how the human brain works. We're super excited when we find something unexpected um, and we um, have cognitive biases that trim us towards always making sense of what we find. And we cannot easily accept the things such as um, random scatter and some um, things that look exciting might not be exciting. That might just be something that happens um, by chance. But there are ways how we could increase um, the robustness. Um, here are some examples that um, point out the opposite. So if we do the opposite of that, um, we can improve. Um, insufficient methodological detail is often published um, in lots of um, big journals. Um, the methods are printed only online or in smaller print um, than the rest of um, the article, um, or they're printed um, at the end of the, as an appendix. It's a real problem because um, stringent methodology is really um, the most important part. Um, and um, while well, the results are obviously what we're interested in to judge how robust the results are, we really need the methodological detail. Um, studies in animals particularly, um, but also in, in human studies, are often underpowered um, uh, studies in animals, hardly ever are blinded or randomized. Um, study designs are overtly um, flexible, meaning you start with something, you find something, and then you adjust your plan based on that. Um, statistics is a big problem um, because uh, we, we show an over-reliance on, on p-values, on simple values. We want things to have simple outcomes. We want things to be either significant or non-significant. Um, but the way we reach those points um, often make the values we calculate almost meaningless. The data produced is highly variable. Um, I've been working with some colleagues who do um, systematic reviews and meta-analysis animal models. And if you've been following this, uh, this series, you've heard something about that before as well. Um, and it's really interesting um, when you, when you uh, look at certain outcomes in animal models um, and how different labs, uh, what kind of results they produce, they're often in dimensions, dimensions um, apart because uh, different labs produce data that uh, doesn't even play in the same scale. Um, effect sizes reported can be small. There's a problem because the um, uh, populations which work in animals are highly um, homogenous, meaning if you already find a small effect size in animals, um, translating that to the very heterogeneous populations of humans um, will not show any relevant effect anymore. And reporting is biased. We all know that even if you don't have bad intentions, you have a lot to do, you have very limited time. Writing papers takes a lot of time and you have five experiments. One of them is significant, the others aren't. Which are you gonna write the paper about? Um, and then there are um, issues around animal care and use that we also of course have to take into account. If I talk for example here about we need bigger sample sizes, um, we have to be aware that there are issues um, around, around animal use and the three R's. Um, talking briefly um, about reporting again, um, systematic reviews of preclinical pain research. Um, so a few here um, is a summary of, of the ones available um, talking about um, reporting. And um, you see on the right is one example um, uh, how high the risk of bias is and what the reporting quality is. It is really bad um, if, we, if we talk in these terms, if we want to talk in these terms, it's really bad reporting. Um, lots of things we just don't know and kind of have to assume that it doesn't happen. Um, like sample size calculations don't seem to be um, prevalent 
um, they're at least not reported. And we know that poor reporting uh, leads to unclear risk of bias. We also know it's associated with higher effect size and larger variance, uh, which shows um, that there's a potential of spin um, if, if these effects um, come into account. Now, what can we do about this? Um, and what do we hope to do about this? Um, again, probably top, pretty to the choir, but if this happens to be the first um, uh, webinar of the series you attend, um, then I'm happy to um, show you this was the equipped consortium, um, the precursor of Go Equipped uh, that, that hosts this, this series. Um, it's a European um, consortium, 28 institutions from eight countries, and most importantly, um, including roughly half um, FPR companies, so European pharma companies, and 10 universities working together um, on this topic. And so vision and objectives of Equip really were to produce um, robust data and to promote robust data and scientific rigor in animal studies and how it will impact on the three Rs, enhance the pace of knowledge gain and shorten the time needed to make new drugs available to patients. By cutting out a lot of, um, of that um, research noise that I've showed you in the beginning. And how would we get there? Um, we would define variables that influence the outcome of preclinical research. Um, we defined um, components um, that will make up the equipped quality management system, um, which you can hear about in, um, I think, the two last uh, of some of the upcoming um, seminars in this in the series. Um, we validated uh, that uh, quality management system, and um, Kim, um, who's hosting the series partly, is uh, also has delivered it on an educational platform for anyone free to. Um, uh, learn something about uh, how to improve your rigor. And then what we've also done and what was, was my main task um, was to define a framework um, of rules where we say if you follow these rules that significantly will increase the quality of your research. How was equipped um, structured? Uh, this, this is the internal structure we had. And um, you can see we all try to work together a lot and work package three, as Renee already has mentioned on research guidelines. Um, this is what I will talk about now. So after this long, long introduction, um, let's get into the work. What have we done in those four years? Um, so we started by acknowledging that um, other people have set out on a similar task and have, have thought about what to do. Um, so we wrote a protocol and subsequently conducted a systematic review of existing guidelines um, on um, research quality. And um, this systematic review ended up including 60 papers um, from which we extracted 58 items um, and we published that systematic review as well. Now, these 58 items um, we uh, put into, into a two-round of Delphi process or subsequent um, consensus meeting um, where we were aiming to assess between um, the participants of the consortium which of these items we find most important. Um, and that helped us narrowing down the list down to um, 33, so roughly half, um, which we then um, decided to include in the final framework. Um, at a consensus meeting in, in Paris, um, we then tried to structure these um, 33 items. And what we did there um, was quite a pivotal decision um, because we discussed um, the existence uh, and, and the, well, almost the burden that exists for um, researchers in filling out um, checklists. So as you know, reporting guidelines for example, arrive or, or um, consort or so um, are almost standard now for, for most of the publications you have. You have to submit along with your publication um, these checklists. Um, that has some effects. Um, it probably, hopefully, increases um, the reporting quality, um, but, but it also creates um, a burden on the submitter, um, the, the authors, because they have to uh, fill in this checklist. It does not necessarily lead to um, them complying with the requirements of the checklist. It just means they check the checklist. Um, and journals hardly have or submit um, the resources necessary to enforce these checklists. So no one really checks um, 
if, if, if you really follow these um, guidelines, um, it's just check that you have submitted the checklist. And we wanted to um, avoid falling into a similar trap, particularly because we thought um, there is always, when you, filling these checklists can occasionally be a bit frustrating because you will sometimes think, well, this doesn't really apply to my paper. What do I put in here now? Um, and we thought, particularly in preclinical research, which is a much broader variety than, for example, randomized clinical uh, trials, which follow a, a fairly similar templates all the time, um, is the the, um, the breadth of um, preclinical research is huge, um, and it would be really difficult to formulate it into checklists um, that has meaning for most, if not all, um, work in this field. Um, so what we did instead was restructured into five domains um, and said, so these are five domains. Everyone needs to follow these domains and all you, uh, everyone who wants to comply with, with the equipped framework uh, needs to follow these domains. Um, but how you do that, we do on a trust basis because essentially we don't have the resources um, to, uh, to, to enforce um, checking uh, um, in, in detail if you followed them anyhow. Um, and the framework was then prospectively tested in work package four uh, and subsequently updated based on the practical implementations um, of the comments of our researchers. So how does it look like? Um, I made this what I thought was really colorful and um, great um, page long printout, like small poster or so um, that um, the journal then decided um, they didn't want was too much text. Um, so it's now free and you can download it. The uh, link is at the end of the presentation. Um, th yeah, if you if you do want to follow the Equip framework, um, please download it. Feel free to print it out and hang it up in your lab. Um, and let me talk about the five domains um, that we ended up um, defining as, as the most important parts. So we're going to start with predefined hypothesis. The point is, um, that you need to decide is what you're doing hypothesis testing or is it not? If it is not, that's completely okay. You're conducting exploratory research, particularly in the preclinical field, is of really high importance, um, but it does change the way how you conduct and how you report um, your work. Uh, so for example, uh, sample size and statistical analysis are very dependent on um, what kind of, uh, uh, of, of strategy uh, you follow. Um, p-values should only appear in anything that is hypothesis testing, otherwise there's no meaning to a p-value because a p-value is rejecting or confirming an hypothesis, nothing else. So start out with that. Um, and then um, this is of course just short form. Uh, we have more examples than following for, for each of these um, domain. Um, how to, to conduct this, um, but just as the spirit, keep in mind, um, begin your day uh, with wondering, are you going to test the hypothesis today or are you not? And if you're not, you're conducting exploratory research and that's um, exciting in itself. The second um, domain then is planning of methods and analysis. Um, so after you've decided um, what type of research you're going to do, um, you can um, start making a plan. Defining um, standard operating procedures will really help you um, both through your experiment and um, for the reproducibility of your experiment. So if on a later day um, you will want to um, confirm what you have done, it's going to be really helpful if you have um, a written set of uh, standard operating procedures that you can keep working by. Um, you can register protocols, which would be really a um, good thing to do if you um, later on want to um, point out that you have done, uh, for example, hypothesis testing um, and that this hypothesis uh, was predefined. Um, you can register protocols, for example, at preclinicaltrials.eu. Um, or you can even just timestamp them in your electronic lab book. Um, many of these, by the way, um, also give the option of um, registering without publishing. So you can register and timestamp something and then only 
um, make it publicly available at the point when you publish the paper so you don't give away um, any of your of your uh, plans um, to competitors. Um, planning also means um, think about um, what kind of controls you will have and what they will mean. Um, so spend spend time on on um, designing your experiments um, so that it will deliver as much value as possible. Well, then there's the big um, statistics block that obviously no one likes. Um, little anecdote from my life. Um, every now and then I'm being introduced to a new co collaboration partner, um, usually by the words um, from someone senior saying, oh, this is Jan, this is my group um, statistician. And the reply is every single time without failing is the other person saying, oh, oh, I hated statistics when I was studying. And I don't blame anyone for that. But that's the reason why you should talk to someone um, who does statistics. Um, all of your universities will have a biometric department that so you can turn to. There are people who specialize in doing um, statistics for um, preclinical work, um, like I do. There are, there are people in your field who can help you. Um, so doing meaningful statistics is going to be really helpful because it's going to take some of that anxiety away from you. Um, and um, instead, it will it will help you to conduct work and use statistics that are most appropriate for your work. Um, you will not end up um, over relying on, on p values uh, that that don't have a meaning for the type of work you did. Um, but instead, you will you will have robust statistics um, that pinpoint you to something that you can build on. Um, while I say it's always it's always worth to to talk to someone, um, it's also uh, world nowadays, where it's really easy to learn about statistics if you want to. Um, you can learn for free, for example, um, in, in our online resources um, from Equipped. Um, and there's many, many YouTube courses and so on um, where you can learn. The software is usually uh, provided um, by university. So feel free to try around, um, but maybe check with someone afterwards um, if, if what you've done is, is uh, meaningful. Also, in statistics, we're going to include the block um, that um, how to present data um, in preclinical work. There's an over reliance of um, of bar graphs uh, that that somewhat obscure the width of actual data. Um, you usually just have a few data points, use granular ways um, to present them. Um, so you start plots or violin plots, or at the very least, um, use box plots. Randomization and blinding, as said, is um, something that um, isn't happening nearly as much uh, as it could in animal research, and it really could. Um, there are always methods to to do that. Um, use validated software for it. Uh, we try to recommend rather than pseudo random processes like this cage versus that that cage. And you can do that multiple stages. Um, you can do the analysis blinded. Um, you can do the handling blinded. Um, and you can do that at, at as many cases, uh, stages as possible. Now, this is often um, where people would then say to me, well, but I test obese mice versus um, none of these mice. So the person handling them cannot be blinded. That's It's obvious when you see these mice. And then to which I say, well, that's fair. And that's why our last domain is documentation. Not all risk of bias can be avoided, but most can be uncovered. Document everything you see, um, preferably, as I said, uh, use electronic lab books or use something like the equipped quality system uh, that helps you really um, put your data and your work together. Um, documentation also includes uh, points like document the flow of animals through your experiment. Um, if you exclude an animal from, from your work, let us know why, Make a, write it down. Usually, we would recommend only do it to predefined inclusion exclusion criteria. If you do it for something else, there can still be reasons to do, but write them down. Note down that it's not to pre, uh, predefined you know, exclusion criteria. Note down why, and then it's a lesson that can be learned for uh, for your next experiment, and you can you can have those kind of reasons included um, in your exclusion list. Um, 
reporting guidelines like uh, the ARRIVE guidelines uh, will help you as a framework to, um, to see how to structure your reporting, your papers, your publications. Um, th this framework in this way um, aims to do a similar thing. Um, and um, yeah, we'd really hope for, for people to take it up. Um, if you scan the QR code either on the last slide or on this slide, um, you can come to um, our, um, uh, the repository. We can find um, this short and the, uh, the longer form handout. As said, feel free to print them out um, to, uh, to work with them. If you want to comply with the equipped um, framework, um, all we'd ask you to do is in your publication write um, we followed um, the equipped framework. If you um, have more space, um, you could briefly address each of the five domains, say how you um, covered the spirit of them um, and um, cite us. And if you do publish um, following the equipped guidelines, please tweet at me um, or at us uh, so that we can promote your work um, because it's going to be really important um, for this kind of work to, to be uh, taken up. What we really need um, is people to use it. It's one thing to publish guidelines, but if no one follows them, um, there's no point. So um, we're now in the phase where we're trying to promote it. I've um, talked to, to um, um, a big um, consortium in the UK, the Advanced Pain Discovery Platform, um, it's a series of grants um, that's now um, promoting the equip framework and recommending it for the preclinical work done um, within UK pain research. And my pain care um, is um, a European consortium um, that in their animal experiments follows these guidelines now as well. So those are the, the steps we're going and we hope, um, yeah, we hope that more consortia, more funders and especially more researchers like you um, take up this work. So with that, um, I'm already at the end. Um, are there any questions? Well, um, first of all, thank you, Jan, um, uh, for this nice overview and uh, presentation, how, um, yeah, where you were coming from and also not just the framework itself, but also how uh, the, the, the process, uh, how we uh, ended up with uh, this. Um, I mean, what, what I like about the, the, the framework is that it's, uh, it is a standalone product. Um, and uh, even though when you look at it, it's sort of that many of these uh, um, uh, things really resonate and, and are, are then picked up in the acute uh, quality system, both sort of uh, developed independently. And uh, of course, the, the uh, equipped system has uh, much, much deeper granularity uh, with the 28 uh, core requirements. So here you nicely present these, these five domains. And, uh, and then I think that is something that... Uh, um, is for many, I think, the, the lower hanging fruit that are shied away initially from the system and say like, oh God, a system, and I don't know, 28 items sounds so much. So I think the number five, you know, is something where people say like, hmm, five I can do. And especially with uh, uh, not having um, a checklist. Um, yeah, a question that, that, that I have is, um, so um, especially coming to number two, where we think about the planning phase and why you already talked about uh, methods that are usually uh, uh, written in, in a very comprehensive manner where we don't see all the details. So, um, and that we need these method details. Um, what's your take on? Uh, should we extend method sections? Uh, should we, uh, uh, or should we just, uh, um, have these documentation at hand if somebody asks uh, for reproducibility or should we make it mandatory that say like, okay, all the, we have the detailed protocols, 
we have to make them available for better reproducibility? No, that's a very good question. Um, I guess we don't have that much influence on it because we're not the um, journal editors. Um, I really think journals are moving in the wrong direction with that. Um, I understand why, because often when I read a paper, I only skim through the method section as well. I understand why they do that. Um, and I do think we have other methods we can um, run our own uh, preprint service uh, where we have method sections that we can. And that has the advantage that every time we do something to the same protocol, we can link to the same uh, method server. Um, and um, of course, journals now um, encourage you to put in the supplementary as well, um, mm -hmm. but supplementaries can get lost. Um, so I rather prefer um, yeah, putting them on, on our own on servers and try to link to them. Um, but yeah, the journals, I think, are setting a problematic precedent with that. Mm. Okay, uh, other people that, that have a question, please speak up. Well, people are still thinking about uh, questions. Um, Jan, so um, when when we think back about the uh, um, equipped framework and how it came about, uh, we always had uh, um, animal research in, in mind. And uh, also, uh, this is where most of the data are, were coming from. So now over the past years, we've seen a, a shift uh, um, also politically demanded to decrease uh, uh, the number of um, researchers, um, increased 3R or 6R initiatives uh, show up, and uh, which then contributes also to data sets that are in vitro, that use uh, cell lines, that use human cell lines, sometimes organoids. Um, so how do you view then the... Uh, um, um, the equipped framework, would you, with this in mind, would you change things? Would you highlight other stuff or would you say still it stands as it is uh, no matter what data? Are yeah, in? we, um, I think we had intense discussions about that. Um, we wanted to make it as broad as possible, but we did at some point realize that most of the people involved were in vitro researchers. So our examples kept being in, in that field. Um, I think it is generic enough that it can be applied to almost all kinds of research. I think the messages we have here, well, to begin with, a lot of the messages we have here probably aren't that unexpected, right? If you've been in the field for a while, a lot of that seems almost obvious to you, but it's still worth repeating it. Um, and I think they apply to almost all research. The examples we use yeah, they're a bit focused on um, on in vivo, um, and it would be nice to expand that a bit to feel that we address more people. Um, but also, I guess you have to limit yourself in, in some ways and make it. If if you try to be too broad and too general, you end up um, at addressing no one. And um, I think our aim was to address uh, in vivo researchers. Yeah. Other questions? Well, maybe allow me one, one final question in terms of uh, um, uh, now, since the uh, um, framework is established and you already said that uh, um, it uh, needs to be made more public, more known. Um, where do you see, uh, you know, the 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 primary uh, recipients uh, for this? Are these these the learned societies? Are these institutions, funders, or or even like a political level? Where would you say is is something that uh, you will people even in the audience? 
would say like, okay, we we can even help uh, transport the message. Uh, where would you see that? Researchers. I mean, funders mm -hmm. would be great, obviously. If we get funders on board, um, that's really helpful. That sends a message um, and that encourages people to think about that. Um, mm -hmm. I saw that in, in some of my research in, over the last years with um, a completely different example, but with um, patient and public involvement, um, that at the point where funders started to demand that, people very actively started thinking about it and very suddenly became integrated into all kinds of um, work. But similar to reporting guidelines, if all you do is demand it of people, they will do a really shitty job with it. Um, so the primary people I always try to talk to are researchers, because um, if you get the people invested who do these things, then you get the best results. If we just, if, if funders demand everyone has to comply with the equipped framework, then everyone will write, we complied with the equipped framework. But what, what would be way more helpful is if people started thinking about, if I comply with the equipped framework, I do better research, I sleep better, and I'm happier with my with my work and my life. Um, so I think um, I always try to um, go to Congress to talk to people um, and um, ask them questions, see where they are, and and try to pick them up and and just get them engaged with the ideas. Great, thank you. Well, I think this was uh, these were some great uh, final words from you, Jan. Uh, again, uh, a message to the individual researchers to think about these. And uh, well, um, thank you very much for uh, uh, a great talk uh, for the equipped framework. Uh, thanks everyone uh, who joined in and um, well, we welcome you back in two weeks for then the next edition of the equipped uh, um, webinar series. And this presentation will also be then featured uh, on our LinkedIn and our YouTube channels. Okay, so stay tuned and um, wish you all a pleasant afternoon.